Well, hello, hello. Tonight we've got a big topic. We're going to talk more about zeros and also about multiplicity. And so that's a totally brand new idea that we're hopefully going to introduce you to. We've got a lot of things to cover. We're going to try to be as efficient as possible. And whereas we keep things moving, but hopefully not too fast where things get crazy confusing. So first things first, as we jump right in, remind yourself that a zero is just another phrase to describe an x-intercept or where the graph crosses the x-axis. And what you'll notice, that our graph here has an x-intercept at negative 3, negative 1, positive 2, and positive 4. Now this nice little definition here says that a zero of a function f of x is any number c such that f of c equals zero. So notice how the output is zero. So based off of my graph, I know that f of negative three equals zero. I know that f of negative one equals zero. Also f of two equals zero and f of four equals zero. So the output is zero for all of those. And we'll just list those zeros right here. x equals negative three. x equals negative one. Notice how we're being really specific by declaring that it is an x value and x equals 4. Now, what in the world is multiplicity? Well, basically for us today, multiplicity describes whether the graph crosses through the x-axis or if it bounces off of the x-axis. Um, so for right now, all I want you to say is that because the graph crosses through at negative 3, the multiplicity is a 1. Same could be said at negative 1, the graph crosses the x-axis, so the multiplicity is 1. However, when we get to x equals 2, notice how the graph touches but then bounces off. And so we're going to say the multiplicity is a 2. And then at x equals 4, it crosses, so the multiplicity is back to 1. So remember last night we talked a little bit about the zero product law and we said basically if a times b equals 0, then one of two things must be true. Either a equals 0 or we said b equals zero. And it all goes back to, you know, zero times anything else equals zero. Well, today we're going to add a little to that notation. We're going to say, well, if the function p of x multiplied by the function q of x equals zero, then one of two things must be true. Either the function p of x equals zero, or the function q of x must equal zero. Now, what would that look like? So if I gave you, and I'm going to if I gave you a nice easy example here, we might say something like, well, if I had the function x plus 1 and I had the function x minus 5 and we said that equals 0, well, last time we said either one of two things is happening. Either this quantity is 0 or this quantity is 0. So if x equaled negative 1 or if x equaled 5, those would be my solutions or my zeros. Well, things might get a little crazier tonight. We might talk about um, what if I had a trinomial x squared minus 5x plus 6 times another trinomial or function x squared minus 5x minus 6. Boy, these look real similar, don't they? If those equaled 0. Well, basically, the zero product law says if this quantity is 0 or if this quantity is 0, then the entire thing will be equal 0. But what you'll notice is we're not factored completely. So we always want to make sure, and that'll be one of our themes tonight, is that we factor completely. Uh, I need two um, numbers with the same sign because of the positive 6. And then over here, I need two opposite signs. And they have to add up to negative 5 when I'm done. So here I've got x equals 3 as a solution, x equals 2 as a solution, x equals 6, and x equals negative 1. I think this slide is going to be really helpful here and it's going to really lay the foundation for us understanding the relationship between a factor and a zero. Now a factor is typically a binomial, although it could be a trinomial um, but, uh, or a monomial really. Uh, but for us it will be binomials mostly. If I said that the quantity x minus 2 was a factor, then what we're really saying is that x equals positive 2 is a zero. Or if I said x plus 5 is a factor, then we're really saying x equals negative 5 is a 0. And you kind of see the relationship of how uh, the number becomes its opposite. If I said 2x minus 1 was a factor, then what we're really saying is x equals 1 half is a 0. And what you could do is you could imagine yourself setting this equal to 0 where you're adding the 1 over then dividing by 2. If I said 5x uh, plus 7 is a factor, we're really saying x equals negative 7 fifths is a 0. Do you think we could turn that relationship around and go the opposite direction? Let's try it. If I said x equals 4 was a 0, who's the factor? Can you picture that? 
doing the opposite or going backwards, we'd say x minus 4 was a factor. Or if I said x equals negative 6 was a 0, who's the factor? Yeah, exactly, it'd be x plus 6. Um, if I said x equals 10 was a 0, then the factor must be x minus 10. Or here's a tricky one. If I said x equals um, 3 halves, try to undo that one or go backwards. This would end up being 2x minus 3 would be the factor. And again, just picture yourself setting this one equal to 0 where you'd add the 3 over and divide by 2. Think we could tie this all together? Here's my conclusion. If, the, if x minus c is a factor of some random polynomial, and we'll call them f of x, then f of c equals 0, and we're going to say c is a 0 of f of x. Okay, here's some new crazy stuff. We, saw, we said multiplicity was going to be a new concept. Earlier we talked about how it relates to the graph, and that'll come up more later in the year. But for tonight, I guess what it really boils down to is multiplicity is the count of the number of times a factor appears in a factored polynomial expression. Now you're wondering, what in the world are they trying to say here? Well, let's try to spell it out. Let's say I had some function f of x, and... Um, we said uh, it was x minus 2 raised to the second, x plus 3 raised to the fourth, and maybe um, x plus 6, okay? Now notice, think about these exponents. What are these exponents telling us to do? We've always defined our exponents as repeated multiplication, right? So what we're really saying is we're repeating a factor x minus 2 twice, right? And we're repeating a factor of x plus 3 four times. And I'll try to write that as neat as I can. x plus 3, and then I need a fourth one. And then luckily, the factor of x plus 6 was only repeated once. So that repeatedness is basically defining our multiplicity. So for example, my first 0 is going to be x equals positive 2, and I'm saying the multiplicity is 2, which all it does is correspond to that exponent. The next 0 is x equals negative 3, and he has a multiplicity of 4, again, corresponding to the exponent, or you can just count the number of times you saw that factor. And the third 0 is going to be x equals negative 6, and it just simply has a multiplicity of 1. Okay, one last definition to go through before we dive into some real live examples and really get into the meat of today's video. Um, what in the world is a degree? A polynomial said to be of degree n if the largest exponent is n, okay? So that's all there is to it. For instance, let's take a look at this first um, quadratic function here, and we're going to say the biggest exponent is a 2, therefore it is said to be degree 2, or we'll just say n equals 2. Now the next one's a little bit fuzzier to see because it's not quite foiled out or multiplied out, but I think we could do it without actually foiling. What you could do is you could kind of envision or multiply, you know, um, ask yourself, if I did distribute all the way through, okay, what term would have the biggest exponent? And I think right here, x times x would equal x squared, and that indeed would be the biggest exponent in that polynomial. Um, the third example, again, we're not going to actually literally distribute this time. We're just going to try to visualize what would happen or who the biggest term would be. So you're thinking, if I did x times x, that would be x squared. And if I multiplied by another x, that would create x cubed. And that's my biggest exponent, so it's a degree 3, or we'll say a third degree polynomial. This next one's even fuzzier. The first group, if I foiled that, the biggest term would be x squared. And then the next factor, if I multiplied him out, by the time I got done, it would be a lot of work, but I'd end up with x to the fourth. And then if I multiplied x squared times x to the fourth, I'd get x to the sixth. That would be my biggest term. Now, I know there'd be a lot more terms there, and I'll just put dot, dot, dot to show there would be a lot more. But I don't care about the others. I just want to know who's the biggest one. So I'm saying here, it's a degree six, or n equals six. All right, we're finally ready to get into the meat of tonight's video. And the question we're going to see a lot of in class tomorrow is to, they're going to ask me to find all solutions, or another way of saying find all the zeros. Basically, a solution is any number that you could substitute for x that would force this entire polynomial to equal zero. All right, so here's, um, it's already factored completely, okay? And I'm going to put a big happy face here because it's already factored. And so I just have to use the zero product law, which basically says... We're going to tee these up, 
and I could say, well, x minus 6, if that factor equals 0, then the whole thing equals 0, therefore x equals 6. Um, if I said 2x minus 7 equals 0, then 2x would equal 7, x would equal 7 halves. And these are probably steps that you feel comfortable doing in your head. And as long as you feel comfortable, don't force it, but if you feel comfortable, go ahead. And if I said ax plus b equals 0, and this one feels weird because it's letters instead of numbers, but all we're doing is subtracting the b from both sides and then dividing by a, and you get negative b over a is another 0. Now the second example doesn't quite get the same smiley face that I gave on the last one because it's not factored completely. So the one thing, let's stress this in our notebooks, we've got to factor completely before we can use the zero product law. And really, in other words, before we can really start to tee things up. Put a little exclamation point there. All right, so what do we have here in our first grouping? Looks like to me two perfect squares. So I'm thinking x plus 11 times the factor x minus 11. And coincidentally, the second group also looks like two more perfect squares. So I'm thinking difference of two perfect squares, 2 thirds x plus 5, and then I'm thinking 2 thirds x minus 5 equal to 0. What we've got here is four factors, all with a multiplicity of 1, and we're just going to focus on teeing this bear up. Now the first two, I'm going to go fairly quick. I'm going to say x equals negative 11, x equals positive 11, so we can just do those real easy. Uh, this next group is going to be a little more challenging. If I subtract the 5 over, 2 thirds x equals negative 5. Now there's a couple of things you could do here. You know, you could say, uh, well, I'm going to divide both sides by 2 thirds, and just type it really carefully into your calculator, negative 5 divided by parentheses, 2 thirds parentheses, and it'll turn out really, really nice. Um, the other thing you could do, is you could rewrite the left side as 2x divided by 3 equals negative 5 over 1 and you could cross multiply from here and I think that makes a lot of sense so you're thinking 2x equals negative 15 therefore x equals negative 15 halves alright same thing over here add the 5 over so I get 2 thirds x equals 5 and I'm just going to be patient I'm going to rewrite the left side as 2x over 3 equals 5 over 1 cross multiply 2x equals 15 x equals 15 halves so there's your four zeros or your four solutions again unfortunately question number three doesn't get the same smiley face the first one did because we're not factored completely yet and so I'm just gonna stress that one more time we need to make sure that we do factor completely before we try to tee it up or use the zero product law okay factor completely this groups already factored in and the reason you know that is it's a linear factor. Uh, the biggest exponent is an invisible one. So that one's all good to go. You can just package him up and ship him down. Uh, the next one here is a difference of two perfect cubes, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite it as something cubed plus something cubed, okay? And let's see, looks like an x had to get cubed and it looks like a 5 had to get cubed. So this is going to be all right, I'm going to use I'm going to let a equal x and I'm going to let b equal 5 and we're going to visualize the formula we had for sum of two cubes. And that formula says a plus b times the quantity a squared minus a times b plus b squared. Okay? Again, if we went a little too fast there, feel free to flip back in your notebook a few nights and look up the formula for the sum of two cubes. And, and what you'll see is it's a plus b, and then over here you had a squared minus ab plus b squared, and we just substituted everything in real carefully. Okay, now our next step is where we set this equal to zero, and I'm going to tee it up, and here's what I'm getting. I'm getting x equals positive one-half x equals negative 5 and then something funny happens alright this last factor is a quadratic yet it's not factorable itself okay so we're saying let's do this let's say this functions not linear okay and the reason I'm saying it's not linear is because of the squared sign and it's not factorable Oops, I don't know if I'm going to be able to squeeze that in there. Oh, no. All right, but it's not factorable, which means it's just done. 
okay? So for us tonight, we're going to say there's only two solutions, and that's these two right here, and there's nothing. We're basically just disregarding this side over here, and we're saying we're done with it. Okay, one more example just like this. Again, we're going to make sure we're factored completely. This is just a standard trinomial. I'm trying to think of two factors that add up to negative 3 and multiply to negative 28. So I'm thinking x minus 7 times x plus 4. All right. Now this one at first, when I first saw the x cubed, I said, oh, it must be another sum of two cubes. But it didn't work out that way because 4 is not a perfect cube. x squared wasn't a perfect cube. But really what it is, is there's a GCF which um, looks like they're both divisible by x squared. And let's see, x cubed divided by x squared equals x. Whoops, 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 I don't want an equal sign right there. Uh, plus 4, okay. Now here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to tee this all up. And for instance, x equals 7, x equals negative 4, x equals 0, and that's what I did is I'm thinking x squared equals 0, take the square root of both sides and get 0, and x equals negative 4 again. So actually, I've got um, to review our multiplicity. 7 is a 0 with a multiplicity of 1. Negative 4 is a 0, uh, but with a multiplicity of 2. And then the, this 0 is actually has a multiplicity of 2 as well, going back to that exponent. Okay, I think you're going to find this one very easy. It says state all, find all solutions are zeros and state the multiplicity of each one. The good news is, is this one's already factored. Um, if you wanted to, and I think this does help, is we could rewrite uh, the factors in repeated multiplication. x plus 5 times x plus 5 times x plus 5. And then we've got x minus 3 seven times. Oh my garage. I don't know if I could squeeze them in there, but we'll do our best. There's my fourth one. There's my fifth one. Um, and then I'll just wrap around and I'll throw two more down here. But what you can imagine here is as we start to tee this up, you're basically just getting x equals negative 5 with a multiplicity of 3. And your second 0 is going to be x equals 3 with a multiplicity of 7. All you got to do is look at these exponents and you automatically know who your multiplicities are. Now, how about this next question I've got? Could you tell me the degree of this polynomial? Okay, and remember, degree is just asking me what's the biggest exponent once I multiply them all out. And if I multiplied an x times an x times an x times another x times another one times another one, yada, 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 I would end up with a big, my biggest term would be x to the seventh. So I'm going to say it's a seventh degree, or we could say n equals seven. Well, we're really going to step things up here on our last slide, and we're going to show you um, a very challenging question that could show up on our spiral, and, and certainly we could see on our, on our final exam in June. Um, the new Common Core is real big on using identities, and so here's an identity that we have used quite a bit. It's called the difference of two perfect squares. And we're going to use that identity to solve this equation. Now, anytime you solve an equation, you always want to make sure that you set the equation equal to zero. And in order to do that, I'm going to subtract this quantity from both sides. Okay. And what that gives me on the left side is it's, I have 2x plus 3 squared minus the quantity 3x minus 1 squared equals zero because those two canceled out and what you have here is this group right here represents the x that you see right here and then this group represents the y that you see right there so you can make a note to yourself maybe let x equal 2x plus 3 and let y equal 3x minus 1. Now you'll notice basically what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use the left side of the identity and when they said x minus y I'm going to use substitutions and I'm going to say x minus y and then the next thing they said was x plus y so I'm thinking x plus y. Um, I wanna, um, we've, we've seen this kind of, I guess, nested 
per set of parentheses before, and I think we can do an even better job with it. You know, making sure we've got some big parentheses, and then we've got these smaller parentheses within that larger set. So we, in other words, we have your primary set, and then you have your secondary sets of parentheses. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be really careful to distribute this invisible one into that group right there. So it's really 2x plus 3 minus 3x plus 1. Okay, and then I just have an invisible one here that I'm going to distribute, which of course doesn't change anything. So 2x plus 3 plus 3x minus 1. And I'm going to work on combining like terms, negative x plus 4, and then 5x plus 2 two it looks like. And remember we did say this entire thing's equal to zero. And so we're we are looking for the factors of the zero. So now that I've got it all cleaned up, I can tee it up. And I'm gonna get x equals looks like positive four and x equals negative two fifths. But again on the this is an extremely challenging question. We're going to have two of them on our sheet to practice more with tomorrow. But by golly, uh, don't panic if, if that looked real crazy. We'll definitely work on it together tomorrow and, and get a little better with them. So have a great night. We'll catch you tomorrow.